without further ado, Stephen, please join me on the stage. People, Stephen Willisie. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Um, Stephen is city architect in Aarhus. He has, has an extensive experience as an architect as well, among other things at Smithham and Lassen, That's right. a great Danish internationally operating firm, setting up business in London and Shanghai, so moving around the world, and now at our hospitality here. So Stephen, take us away, 45 minutes, Thank and learn us what ours has been doing. Thank you very much for the kind introduction and the incredible hospitality I've been given here since I arrived yesterday. It's wonderful. I have to thank you, Bas and Barbara from AIR and the team generally for looking after me. Um, I, I bumped into uh, uh, the, the chief planner here in uh, Rotterdam at the Academy of Urbanism, where there was a, a challenge for becoming the European City of the Year. Um, Rotterdam was up against us, and there was uh, Bologna, I think. And uh, unfortunately, we were the second city again. <laughs> he did a very good performance. Uh, I always said we would have to beat Rotterdam, the team to beat. So the congratulations on that. Uh, I'm also very happy to be a part of this. Since you started in 2009, you've had a, a vast array of very interesting, uh, prominent uh, uh, international guests talking. We've had the pleasure of meeting Larry Beersley, for example, in Aarhus. We visited them in Vancouver too. But it also has uh, some very good, interesting ideas going on here. And this whole idea of city making, I'm going to steal and take back to Aarhus. It's definitely a good way of talking about the city and making the city. It's, uh, it's, a, it's very important to get everyone on board. So very, very happy to be a part of this. These second cities, what do they have in common? Amsterdam, Rotterdam, Edinburgh and Glasgow, Copenhagen, Aarhus. It could be Dublin, Dublin and Cork. I, I think there's a, there's a certain grittiness about these second cities. Um, some of them are quite tourist orientated, whilst others like ourselves are probably more business orientated and very, I, I call them the naughty younger brother or the naughty younger sister who has to get on and do things and just rest on your laurels. So there's always this kind of edge to what we're doing. That's what I like to think anyway. <clears throat> Home is where the heart is. I'm actually English. I've been living in uh, Aarhus 34 years. So it's, my heart has moved closer and closer to Aarhus, I have to say. And for those of you who don't know where Aarhus is, it's on the, the Kattegat Sea between Sweden and, and, uh, and, and of course, Aarhus here. You can see on, the, on this, this Copenhagen. We sometimes liken this, it's more Swedish than and Danish. That was a joke, actually, but... Uh, <laughs> I'd like to talk about this, this thing about governance, because it's in, in actual fact, working within a city organization, you suddenly realize how things work. I've been working in this role for, th uh, for seven, nearly seven and a half years, and uh, I've learned a lot doing this, having worked in private sector. I rushed into the job like a bull in a china shop, and I just couldn't understand why they didn't listen to the city architect more. I have technical meetings every week, and I said, why, what's the point of having a city architect if you're not going to listen to them? And one of the social democratic uh, members of the council said, that's a very good question, Stephen. And then luckily he smiled. But uh, that put me in my place, so I suddenly sort of realized this. But this is my older man. He's the uh, head of technical and environmental services. And this is the council. This is our council chamber designed by Anna Jacobson, a wonderful space. And it's a city map from 1940 they're sitting on or walking on. So it's very symbolic. It's the urban, urbanicity of, this, of this, uh, the city. And obviously it's changed. We're in the process of making a new carpet because it's worn out. I'm, I'm asking, trying to get permission from the national organization about uh, uh, listed buildings, if I can draw a line on that map to indicate where the city is today, because it's quite different. But you'll see here, this is, uh, oops, so I'll go back one. Uh, I'm in this one. There's only 1,400 people, but when they meet every week, 
It's our department has the most things on the agenda, actually. And the technical committee and these other committees, permit committees, meet once a week. This is where the decisions are made. In 2017, something very important happened for Aarhus. We've been working on it for some time with European Capital Culture, and this is my older man, um, Rabi Azad Ahmad, uh, who runs the Culture and Citizen Services. So this is very important. We used this uh, slogan, let's rethink, and it became very much a kind of a, a slogan for the way we're working with many things within the city. And uh, I'll come on to this when I talk about some of the urban projects we're working on. But it was also a mind shift for us. We're only 300, actually this month, 350,000 people. Um, compared to yourselves, it's you know, roughly double the size. But uh, it was a big change for us because it, it, we actually found out that we can do it. A sort of a confidence builder. The beautiful thing about that project was it wasn't just Aarhus. It was the whole region. Oh, sorry. I'll get used to it at some, some point. This whole region, there's 1.3 million people. There's 19 municipal municipalities work together on this project. So it's not just Aarhus. It was, a, it was a partnership project, and this is very important. I mean, it's not like Liverpool or Glasgow, where it's like one city. This is a regional project. And we have also the metro Metropolitan Aarhus, or the Greater Aarhus on the other side, which is a kind of a business agreement we have with each other. Because size does matter somehow in relationship to these discussions we have with the national government. So every second year, we do a kind of a temperature. We take the temperature of the citizens of Aarhus. We ask, what makes Aarhus a good city for you? And um, the last two times we've done this, uh, the culture comes out top. Uh, the cultural life of the city is roughly 40% of the citizens. 31% say that it's the relationship with the nature and the green areas. And, and third, the size of the city. You know, what's that? I mean, it, the interesting thing, it's not too big, it's not too small. It's a walkable city, and it's very well can easily connected to the nature. And of course, it's a student, student city. Um, so let's bear this in mind. Aarhus has many faces. This is the inner city, the old Latin quarters, where we have beautiful, charming uh, streets with um, cafes and what have you. This is the old town. It's a freelance museum. And of course, we have this Dock One, which is, uh, I mean, if you Google Aarhus, these things will come up. Um, adventurous housing schemes in the, in the Harbour District and the Aros Art Museum, very important cultural venues and destinations. I'll come into these in more detail, but also recreative areas. This is in the, the new Harbour District called Aarhus, Ooh, the East Aarhus uh, Island there, which has just been completed last, last summer, this uh, swimming pool. Um, but this vicinity to the nature, this is the basis of everything here. The first Vikings had their settlement here, just on this edge. Oops, damn. So, oh, am I going back too far now? Yes, excuse me. I'll t I think I'll just look forward all the time. So the Vikings settled here, and they've been that we've been here since, but it's only a t 10, 15 minute cycle or run from the center to this forest to the south. Um, but this connectivity, when I came to Aarhus back in 1980, in the early 80s, first visiting my, uh, my girlfriend, this is what the central street in Aarhus looked like. It's called Aarhus Boulevard. Aarhus Boulevard means river street, but there's no river. You know, I thought, what's that all about? I mean, it was covered over because of health, health risks and what have you, but back in the 90s, they opened it up. I just, just have to say, some of these projects were very unpopular at the time. And this is where governance becomes really important and city leadership. They stood fast and made sure that this opening up the river came. And it's now become, everyone was thinking it's going to, all the shops will go bankrupt. There's the main road into the harbour. The, the harbour will go bankrupt. Of course it didn't. But people don't like change. Or they don't mind change, but they don't like the consequences. Look, this is the consequence of that. What's not to like? Similarly here. I mean, we talk about livability. And these, this, the city life can pay itself many times. The, 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 level, the price level of properties along the river, the city life, you, you can't, the, the prices of the properties have gone up many times. 
and uh, we're getting a lot more revenue tax-wise and so on. So all these projects have been financed several times now. Of course, the university city, you can't underestimate the importance of this. It's like in Rotterdam, I know. There's, it's a young city, but it's also attracting very strong workforces. We have clusters for, we're the windmill capital of the world. Most windmill companies have their R&D in Aarhus. Agro Foods Park, it's an important venue in Aarhus, and the University Hospital here. I, I'm not going to dwell too long on this, but the city's growing like mad, and we're aiming to make a compact city. Similar issues you're facing here in your city, trying to make it compact instead of people driving in. The large housing estates, just urban sprawl, we're trying to control this much more. So this reconnecting... I, this is the best view of Aarhus, I think, looking from the, the harbour front at what it looks like today. You've got Dokken on the left and uh, the university campus on the right and the cathedral in the middle. But back in the 90s when the container harbour became dormant because the, the water was too shallow, we built a new container harbour. Does this ring a bell? I think this happened everywhere in the 90s. There's many European harbour cities, coastal cities, had this opportunity. Sitting on gold, we call it. But we took the, the challenge and made an international competition and made a master plan, and that's gone through many iterations. And I won't go into this too much, but because it's not necessarily the culture base, but this is the most recent development finished on that harbour area out in the other container area, designed by Big, with a, a swimming area on, the, on, the, on this, in this basin. And the livability factor, this is temporary shops, whilst we call it a livable city a sort of building site um, um, wall because of the big sites behind and uh, this is where people obviously come and go. And this is a new look of Aarhus when you come sailing to or from Aarhus. It's quite dramatic. This is the latest project which Big is also in the process of building. Um, this is a big hotel conference centre. A mountain path walking around all the building, so you can actually come up around about 90 metres, walking along the whole building into a conference centre with space for two to 3,000 people and a 500-room hotel and housing in the central area here. We're in the process of building these now. There's a theatre here. So this whole idea of reconnecting is very important for our uh, heritage. Very important. This is what it used to look like. Um, looks like this now. I have to show some images now because it's, we sometimes forget. The red light is what the city edge of the city looks like now in relation to the harbour. The, the old um, harbour piers here, these have been removed. This is extended and we made new canals here. So we've actually reconnected much more of the water. But it looked like this back in the 80s. A typical harbour front, railway lines severing the, the old heritage from the, the inner city. But then... It looks like this. And I, say, I have to say, this. people forget this. And they were also against us doing this. But now they've got this beautiful corridor, uh, light railway line, and fewer roads, lanes. Look like this. Looks like this now. I call this a little bit of Venice. There's no curbs around that beautiful old building. And it's just become people-centric. And, uh, you know, everyone was against this as well at the time but uh, people have grown to love it. And in the evening, it looks something like this. this. This piece here is, oh God. This one is a, a light fountain by uh, Jeppe Hein. And uh, of course, it's a, a very flexible area in the central area here. So these are kind of, kind of cultural venues within the city, in the public realm, we've we invested a lot of money in. We've said, we're not gonna build on them. We're gonna make them open and accessible for the general public. We've built these canals and these uh, basins uh, with uh, our own money saved up from selling the sites. This map is very important. It just says something about the cultural connectivity of the way the city works. It's a, some kind of banana. Um, I'm just going to take care now. All these are the names of cultural venues in the city. And this is where the Dokken, the library building, is here. But what we're doing here, this whole area here has just become recreative as well, culturally, cultural spaces, and reconnecting this area up to the Aarhus University. So it's a very um, 
the whole city is encompassed by these cultural venues. And uh, I, I mentioned the, the old town. This is one of the most important visiting places in Aarhus. Uh, we realize that the more cultural venues we have, the longer people stay in Aarhus. They're going to use a bit more money in Aarhus. This is the botanical garden right next to the, the old town, the Gamble Butte. This is the Palm House. Um, the original uh, building was uh, this one, also designed by Safe Muller, and they won the competition to build this. A beautiful, and it's lit in the evenings. It's very interesting, uh, very, very popular venue. 80,000 people visiting there annually. The, uh, the old town is, uh, I think it's 700,000 people here. It's, it's a, a magnet. And then, of course, the cultural center with the music concert house. This is the first one built outside of Copenhagen back in the 80s. Um, the city insisted on it at the time, and most cities in Denmark have one of these today. But at the time, we didn't need this. We should invest money in more play schools and what have you. But the cultural, this is the firm anchoring point for our cultural activities in Aarhus. And we have Aros, your rainbow panorama on the top by Olaf Eliasson. Uh, a fantastic venue. It's, it's a wonderful site, a place to come. And this is the interior of it, designed, also designed, designed by you know, Schmidt Hamlassen. And uh, in the process of talking to James Terrell, the light artist from um, Arizona, this is Morton Schmidt, the partner of uh, Schmidt Hamlassen, designing this space and looking at this project called Next Level to be built between the music co concert house and the Aros in the park. So, so this is another addition to this uh, cultural heritage. Six kilometers out of town, we have this wonderful piece of architecture by Henning Larsen and Christina Jensen in the most historical uh, glacial landscape, moraine landscape, we built this, just lifted up the earth and put a building underneath it. It's a magnificent building. We, found, we have something called the Grau Bellemen. It was a man found in a bog uh, and the whole museum is built up around that. So the university actually has a faculty here, archaeology, ethnographics, and uh, um, sociology, and they have an auditorium up here. I think it's 1,100 students working here regularly, a research department. So this is a partnership project, building this museum. The university is involved in this. And this is the way it's going to go more and more, I think. We can't stand alone as a council or as a you know, national organization. I put this in because these two guys, these Dutch brothers, you probably know them. They're world famous. They make these people. Um, I told you about these yesterday. Alf Adrian Alphonse, uh, Alphonse uh, Kinnis. And it's absolutely amazing what they do. They're all over the world, these people. And... Uh, when you go, we've got seven of them in this building. They cost a fortune. But they, they're almost, you know, they, you actually see them, you nearly think they're going to move because they're so lifelike. But I think you need to know this. There's a lot of talent around. And then smaller projects like this, the Infinity Bridge. These are two, two former students of mine. Designed this wonderful bridge for sculptures by the sea venue. It's very cheap. It's just been taken down because it's a seasonal event, because of the winter, it could just get blown away. So it's taken down now and comes up again in the spring. But it's a fantastic place. This is where you get all your wedding photographs taken now. Really, it's, it's like, in a weekend, there's like 14 weddings going on at the same time. It's very crowded. And you get worried about the weight, because you know, can you stand it? It's great. And then the interesting thing about the culture is that this is on the rooftop of a big superstore in town. They've invested in culture. They've made this rooftop scape and this theater. And it, the, within one year, they had 1,500,000 guests. What do you think that does with your turnover in the shop? It's a fantastic venue. And culture is also a very t important tool in terms of regeneration. We have this cultural site on the old freight yard, which um, is a catalysator, the Guzbane. And it's a cultural production center. And we have uh, all these facilities inside, these workshops. 
You only have to pay for your materials. You can get, you have a mentor, you have a person helping you. It could be graphic workshop, it could be, it could be uh, making, digital uh, production, metal workshop, timber workshop, ceramics, or even textiles. And one of the holes in the, the building is left raw, so you can actually have venues there, uh, rent it whenever you want. It's not insulated. But this, this uh, I'll just go back one. This image here in, in the corner here, they're preparing for Christmas as we speak. So there's a big Christmas market going on in there. But it's a, it's a melting pot. And these are the guys, right, who are actually standing around helping. They're pensioners. They've got lots, lots of knowledge and they're assisting people. You know, the uh, volunteers coming in and out, and there's a great team, a very vibrant atmosphere. And you can rent studios there for three months and do, uh, do carry out work here. There's someone doing some work in one of the studios. This is one of the, the workshops here. I love this place. And it looks like this on the outside. Whilst being waiting to develop the area, this group called Institute for X have taken over these buildings and built these, these sorts of things. And we've, I've had to you know, take a blind eye for it because it's completely against the building regulations and everything. But they're fantastic venues. Um, and there's the Viking Club. They meet every Wednesday. <laughs> and they battle away. And I just love this picture because, you know, it was just, I was just there at the time. I took the picture and there's this couple here eating their, their evening sandwich. You can see her smiling. What the hell's going on here? Look at them. Gro grown men. Playing, being boys again, it's great. But they're building an architect school on that site. It's uh, the first in Denmark, like, ever. And it's on site at the moment. There's a big hole. And what do we do with all these groups around here? This is where this inclusive approach becomes more and more important. And I'll get on to this even more when we talk about the dock one. This is my town mayor, Jakob Bunsko, and this is the guy that runs Institute for X, this community. A couple, uh, I think four years ago in the budget negotiations, the, the mayor put 500,000 kroner on the table to make something called the Budales Contour. It's a small office space on that area who would be the kind of bridge between the council and the developments coming along. And we made this uh, group, and it's financed by the, supported by the council. So they become very legitimate all of a sudden. And he said, you know, they're going to be a stone in your shoe, Stephen. Because it, it, it's not going to make it so easy all the time. So it's really cool. And this is all part of the sisters' engagement thing. This is, my, this is Captain Bunscore and Benjamin Barber, if mayors rule the world. If you haven't read the book, you should try and do that. He died, I think, last year, unfortunately. Fantastic book. And we spend a lot of time in all our processes now working with citizens. I just want to share this with you. You may have heard of it. It's a door. It's a magic door. You can open that door. This is in Copenhagen. But you could be talking to someone in Prague or in Stockholm if you have a similar door. It's a bit like Harry Potter. But this whole thing about citizen engagement and the technology possibilities we have we, we're, we're challenged a lot. I often, the people are coming to these meetings are my age group. You know, they're rather set in their ways and um, they're not representing the full community. And uh, I just thought this is, a, this is something of the Alexander Institute from Aarhus. They have an office in Blocks in Copenhagen and they have this community. I sit in their steering body. And I always say, I want to show, I want one of these. I haven't, I haven't got the money to do it yet. But uh, I'm just saying this, this city... This small community on the Good Spain or the freight yard area, this is a site meeting with two of my colleagues from the council. She's a lawyer and he's a project manager for the whole area. And these are representatives from Institute for X and it's a site meeting. They meet once a week. It was a nice day. That's my sketchbook here. Uh, and I try to participate in all those I can. Obviously, I can't do it all the time, but I just, I just love being there, being part of it, because this is where it's all happening. Because all these projects are being built as we speak. Institute for X have their property here. And we're designing all this area together with them. 
and they're connecting up with the architect school and with this site here, which is for Lidl. They're building the parking building and we're covering the whole building with containers. So Institute for X becomes Institute X for, for X two zero nil. So it's the next generation of Institute for X. I said, you have to grow up. You can't just carry on urban sprawl. You have to go more compact. So they've gone with this and they're working on that. So that's, that's going to be really exciting. So this whole sustainable agenda has been involved in all these processes, not least in the number 11, but we're also talking about poverty and uh, obviously health and well-being. They're being integrated in all these projects. One of these is one of the challenged areas in Aarhus, um, the largest challenge area uh, in terms of social cohesion and unemployment. This map on the right shows the uh, wage levels. The, the, the big one, the red ones are the wealthy areas and the blue are the, the, the low income areas. And um, Gallup is obviously here. And this is a ring road, ring by. It connects all these uh, non-profit housing estates, which are low income areas. It's a really, we're investing millions of uh, corner in all these different districts. And uh, it's very challenging. I know similar issues all over the world. Uh, this idea of trying to be inclusive societies and make them work. So we're investing massive amounts of money, changing them from monofunctional districts to multifunctional. And this is just, <clears throat> it's only four and a half kilometers from the city on the outskirts, but we've invested in two billion corner already just in Gallup and Tovershoi, completely redesigned the park district so it's safer. And this sports football, multi-use football pitch has become a kind of a central space for this area. Um, a new road system prepared for the light railway system to connect it out. But this area, whole area with the red buildings is for the younger generation. So when we're planning these areas, it's for 30 years or something. It's too late for these ones. So we've made something called uh, Instant, Instant City along that edge. And this is where we're actually planning all the cultural activities and a new school, community school on that site. And there's an entrepreneur, uh, hands-on uh, an entrepreneur building here, temporary use, to try and encourage people to get employment. So we're doing lots of things. This is a new cultural center, a new library, a new uh, social activities, uh, um, rock climbing clubs, all sorts of things. And that's on site now. The library is a very important thing for this uh, library learning center to try and include people, and the, especially the younger generation. So it's really exciting times. So back to the harbor front. The point is here is that culture and the activities within the cultural domain are very important for encouraging social cohesion, but also bringing people together in, in lots of different levels and different ways. When I talk about the Dokken now, I have to say it's been a project that's been on the go for, since the 90s, the idea of building such a library. The choice, the first year had 1.3 million guests. Uh, we didn't expect that. Uh, it's, it's quite overwhelming. The popularity it's had, it's roughly 5,000 people a day. It's, it's quite something. It's, it's a wonderful place. But when we did it, we talked very much about the urban flow and re, the opportunity of using the city in a new way. You'll see here, this is the river before it was uh, covered, uh, opened up. And the Dockham was uh, the final part of that planning. And there's a connection. This is the, the main station, the shopping center down to the cathedral. 50, 60,000 people go back and forth here every day. We would like them to, instead of going back and forth, maybe make a loop. Uh, you'll see this, uh, this is the loop. And we've been developing program for this site here, this is where the, the bus station is today. And uh, we thought, well, uh, let's get this going. But as we've been working, the old bus terminal has been converted into a street food market. And they've had 1.3 million customers in a year. And there's, there's just a young couple who wanted to make a street market. And we've you know, pulled out the stops and said, yeah, well, that's good. We've got you know, health and safety and things like this. Help them make toilets and the full infrastructure. But it's just taken over and that loop's already established. So it's really a really exciting development. And this is another, another side of culture, right? 
So looking at this original plan for this harbour front, you'll see these, this is where the docking is, and this is the uh, uh, University Engineering Faculty, which is built here now. Uh, it's, a, it's just a wonderful idea. It's an urban space which has been covered by a roof. So it became, as during the project phase, it became something called Urban Media Space. I still like that name because it says something about the urban idea behind the project. So, the architect, uh, Kim Holtz from Schmidt Amalassen, made this sketch. It tells everything, I think. But to get that far, they spent two years developing the program. And this is probably the most important part of this project, is developing that program, how it should be used and what's it to be in it. I'm looking at you because you know this from your visits to Aarhus. It's a, it, we are in the old library, they set these workshops up. These are some uh, slides from uh, the previous director for, for libraries, Rolf Happel, uh, who was the director at the time. Um, and they just transformed it in the weekends and afternoon activities, testing things, asking people what they thought, recording them, making films of them, uh, developing things, small making spaces, workshops. I love this because of the different generations. Making, a people's lab, testing things. So all these different groups going on simultaneously and at different times, correcting data and making these diagrams to try and help us, you know, focus our energies on the different things. I'm sorry this is all in Danish, but there's in innovation here, inspiration space, learning space, space empowerment, meet, meeting rooms, engagement spaces, performative rooms, all these things, developing them. And this is probably the most important sketch at that time, was this diagram showing all the different things in a, in a square. The citizen engagement, quiet areas, family areas, children, meeting rooms, the uh, cultural citizen and uh, services department, question areas, social uh, advice, advice, advising spaces, all sorts of different things. Uh, reading, newspapers, workshops, cultural, everything's in there. It's a melting pot. And they could actually be moved around anywhere in that plan, more or less, unless it's a very quiet space. So this was the vision. I don't need to read it up. Um, it's, it's just that it's people-centric and it's very great focus on children and families, but the whole idea of uh, motivating, making a place, a venue to come, learn, interact, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a wonderful melting pot community space. It's more than a library, but library is the, the glue that brought it all together. And it, you've got to have people like this. This is Maria Ustegor, who was the, the chief librarian for all the 19 libraries in Aarhus. And she was in the process all the way through uh, working with uh, these engagement groups. She took over after Wolf for the director of this, this area. So this is just, just some boring plans. This is the ground floor. This is maybe the least successful part of the plan. The light railway lines underneath, it's a traffic hub. There's um, 986 automatic parking spaces underneath in the ground. It's designed by Germans, so it actually works. I say this because we've had problems with national railway systems made in Italy. It didn't work. Any Italians here, I'm really sorry. And, you know, I just admire this. We had one hiccup, or a couple of hiccups, where a car got thrown out. And I believe it was a Citroën. So, the river. On the coastal situation, it's a, it's a, it's a, we're, in, we're in danger. Two years on the trot, in the winter period, the river was very close to flooding. I have to say, this is very, very exciting times, especially we lived in that, in that inner city. The lower diagram shows what the flood would have been if it had just gone to, like 10 centimeters above the, uh, the, the, uh, the level that the river was at, on the, the, the edge of the, the river. So during the planning of the library, uh, urban media space, 
we worked together with Ors Water and built these uh, climate prevention areas and lifted the whole of the coastline. Uh, that red line there indicates two and a half meter line. So everything in front of that could be flooded. Um, but we've built these, uh, all these different things. There's pumps here that's actually pump 80,000 cubic centimeters of water a second. I've been told that's a lot of water. It's abstract figures, right? But these are the two important plans. This is the first floor plan and this is the second floor plan. And they're connected by this wonderful ramp uh, that goes uh, th through this, this area here in the center. So it's a series of urban spaces connected. It's completely open with this uh, box space in the middle, multi sale and you can walk all around this. Uh, and those functions I showed you on the diagram have been positioned here on the site. And then the upper floor level, this is office space. Just a point of note, the cultural and citizen services from the council and the city archives have the area here. So all this area here is run, area run by that council department. All the other part are public. So this is just to show that the plan itself is designed in such a way they are constantly in visual contact with the exterior. So it's your part of the urban realm, visually. It's like walking along the street inside the building. You've got a view at a distance through the area. And this is a lovely section. Um, parking area underneath, fully automatic. Infrastructure area and the library here. Citizen department here and the office spaces which have been rented out. Time's running along. The whole plan area was financed by the Real Dania, a philanthropist organization. So 750 million corner was used on the parking basement and the public realm. The rest was paid by the council, the total of 2 billion corner. But this is the connectivity out to the bay and it works at much relief. It does work and people will actually enjoy this. So as you come up on the building, it's about 2,000 square meters of covered external space, this overhanging roof. Fantastic urban realm. And it's different uses all the time. In the winter, it's a running track. And you're running up and down the staircases doing fitness, you know, your staircase training. And they're running all over the place. It's a fantastic venue. And you're dry. This is the main entrance area, and you've got this uh, active screen on the left there. So guests can actually deliver text messages or um, Instagram pictures and quotes anywhere and put that on, so you're always in contact. But this, it's like being in a, a transit space. This is where you come here and get your, your passport and what have you. You can see the maker sign. I put it in because of the, this, this festival. Just thought it was really cool. These are just a series of images showing the different uses going on. Because it's a university town, it's, we have very few reading space, not enough reading space at the university. We have 55,000 students. So you've got to be here really early to get a space. So, the, you know, the, all the tables and the workspace are taken by about 9.30. So you've got to get up early, especially in the exam period. Here there's a gaming, gaming conference going on. In the central eight, uh, ramp, maker spaces. There are some books in there. You'll be relieved here. But we have 19 libraries, and the books are in const constant rotation between them. So that we have also a, a distant uh, storage area, but we try to keep the books in use constantly. So we can get books within uh, uh, 12 hours. So these are, uh, you see the toddlers there? I love this. You have the interactive floor. And the, the children, children, it's like playing football on, on, the, on the floor, digitally. You can actually kick, move things. And these kids are playing together. And then on the, on the picture here, this space is completely soundproofed. So they can shout and scream and go on and do what everything kids do in a, a, a protected area, whilst other things are going on around. It's been very well thought through, I think. Yeah, uh, completely flexible. A chess tournament going on. 
all things going on at the same time. And it, uh, just this, just lively activities. It's very flexible space. This area where I'm t the photographs taken from is very much children, small children orientated. And this, the gong, this is, we have to, I think it's uh, used 1% of the, the price of the building on art, public buildings. So we have three pieces of art. I've only got two pictures here. This is the gong. Every time a child is born in Aarhus, that bell rings. So from the hospital, there's a link. And the father or the partner has to press the button to get that activated. And it's, I tell you, when that rings, everything goes quiet. And there's a smile on everyone's face. It's really beautiful. It's uh, Kirsten Wopsoff that made that. It's the heaviest bell in the world, apparently. I think it's made in Belgium. Very few places could produce it. Then down underneath in the parking area, there's magic mushrooms by Elgrim and Drags, Dragset, Norwegian, and um, well, I can't remember the other guy, a Danish guy, and made this project. And before that was made, it was a non-space. Now it's a kind of a public space in the area where people can leave their car and go there and look up and think, oh my God. It transported and it's an imaginary city. It's fantastic. So when we get to the outside area, the selling fountain, the people who do that roof, uh, roof landscape project, have a philanthropist uh, section of their, of their business and they finance this play area around the site. So it's the world corners around the world. So they built these different play areas uh, designed around the, the, the north, south, east, west. Uh, you, you can see there's pieces of ice here. I often stand up here looking down here. It's one of the best places because all age groups walk across here. And the kids are there with their grandparents and they're shaking like mad and it's, everyone's laughing. And if I've done guided tours, I have like 50 people, they all have to walk across that. They, they have a lot of fun. And of course, this is North America. It's very imaginative. And since the building was built, the Danish national television has moved their tele uh, weather forecasting and sports department to this building. So it's been adjusted so it can take this. So the background of Aarhus and the harbour front is on your screen every night. We love it. So just a few images here. This is... Every year we have the festival week. This one year we use the canopy as a digital uh, screen. It was designed by a, a German, a, a group from Berlin, a digital screen. It was absolutely fantastic. It was terrible weather, but there's lots of people came down to watch this. And finally, I go away for a little bit from Dokken. This idea of working with the city as a laboratory, testing things during a cultural event. Rather like you, you have this festival day today, using the public realm to test things. This is the main space in front of the railway station. Normally it looks like this on the left. And then it was transposed for 10 days into a space where all the cars, the taxis, everyone was taken away and made into a people-centric space. So we talk about the urban life, the design of the urban space, and then you can design the buildings. So underneath these, there are bus stops. Shelters. See those? Oh, see those there? They're bus stop shelters. And this is a hot dog stand, redesigned. And this was, became an amphitheater. Uh, time's running out. I go through this quite quickly now. This was spontaneous activities came along. I say, why not? And this wonderful thing for me as a city architect is we start talking about this in the town city chamber. Why don't we do this? People love it. And this park, it was a breaker. It's the music house and the town hall on the bottom part of the picture. We closed the dirt road down and made, put a piece of grass on it. And did this. It's just amazing, isn't it? Why not? Because it's going to mess the traffic up, isn't it? This one, the public space in front of the cathedral, that was made into a forest for 12 days. And it looked like this for 12 days, day and night. People love this. And on the back of this, 
This area here next to the cathedral was a parking space in the heart of the Viking city. And I said, let's do this. So we did it. And um, it cost five and a half thousand, 5.5 million corner. If I had to do this permanently, it would cost a lot more than that. Because it's temporary, permanent, it means the politicians are willing to take a chance. And then maybe we can make something permanent. I think it's really exciting. And then we have art projects. This bridge changes colour over 12 hours. It's like watching paint dry. But if you go away for an hour, come back, it's a different colour. I mean, 10 seconds. This one, because the river is also a little bit uh, scary to cycle and stuff, I tried to alter the face of it by introducing art projects with light. Yeah. This is a Swedish young artist who designed this light project. Um, this is another one, the French uh, British group designed this on the river. Still working. You know, it hasn't been vandalized yet. And then another one where they've got these tricky uh, uh, areas in town. A tunnel here, which has been transformed by light. And it is just, uh, we've been financing these projects by uh, changing the halogen lamps, lights around the city with LED. And the, prof uh, the money we're saving, we can finance those projects. So this is the last project. This is UN European Capital Culture. Uh, the Aros Museum did this installation along the, on the, on the uh, Catherine Gloss. was there for several months. caused such a disturbance. I tell you. And actually, these, that tree here is still red. <laughs> and we left a couple of these pieces of pavement with these colours, but it's all been cleaned up now. And that, I'm just trying to say this, uh, culture is an important driver. And uh, on many different levels, sustainability not least. Thank you very much.